It's been a hell of a couple of weeks here in our community. So much to talk about between the COVID, the mass demonstrations that have developed over the last several weeks. Had the opportunity to get out there, speak with demonstrators, see firsthand what's going on on the line, not only from the perspective of demonstrators, but from the perspective of, of police. And it really doesn't do it justice by watching it on television. Having that insight and having that experience on the ground for hours on hours and seeing the way things develop out there, that was just incredibly valuable, insightful, impactful, and you're more than welcome. And I encourage you to, to get up on our Facebook channel and, and go back. We've posted all of those live streams for the, from the last several nights, and I, I think you'll find it just as valuable as we do. No less valuable has been a guy that's really be, you know, put him on the map, this, this demonstration and, and these events, and that's been the commander of the Central Division, that's Captain Brad Koch. Captain Brad Koch has been with the demonstrators essentially from day one and walked literally every single mile with them in their route. He took some time, though, to sit down with us and unpack what life's been like since he's been on that 107-mile journey with those demonstrators. You must be exhausted. Not really. I mean, I'm, I am, we've done a lot of walking. Uh, you know, I, I think that I'm just trying to do my part for, for the community. I think as the commander over the Central Division that it's my responsibility to be out there to, to really help facilitate these peaceful demonstrations. You know, initially the, it, people, called it a protest, and I, I think there's a lot of negative connotation with that. So it's really a movement or a march or demonstration, and um, I think it's my responsibility just to help ensure the safety of not only the officers, but also the community members out there that are voicing their concern and, uh, you know, their First Amendment right. It's, you know, the optics are incredible. It seems like you've built some really deep relationships out there with some of the demonstrators. I'm honored. Uh, the people that I've that I've met with and that I've that I do really consider friends and I really think that there will be some significant change uh, for the better that comes out of uh, out of all this you talked about that emotion if you could really capture it all in a word would it be you know what is it frustration anger on the side of, of, of demonstrators you know I think they're just tired I, I think you know, there's a lot of chanting that goes on, and, and as I'm sleeping at night, I'm, I'm replaying the chanting in my mind. Yeah. And, uh, you, know, you know, one of the things that really stuck with me is that is one of the chances that I'm, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel that. I feel that um, it's, been a, it's been an emotional week for me. You know, it's been a, I'm almost 50. It's a, watershed moment in in my life there's never been anything like this i mean it's a worldwide movement it's really a seminal moment i think for for us as a as a generation what lessons have you walked away with i know you and i we've talked a lot offline and this has changed you too it's not only changed our community but personally there's been some change for you yourself oh yeah but i mean it's given me perspective in terms of how i'm not sure you know, if you've noticed, but I'm a white male, and I've probably, I'm, I'm pretty confident I've never been stopped by police because of the color of my skin. I've had a lot of, you know, really heartfelt conversations with people about frustrations that they've had with police. I think it's my responsibility and my duty to try to treat everybody fairly, equally, um, you know, and and just make sure that justice is applied across the board, regardless of your gender, skin color, religious affiliation, some of the tenets that we as police officers swear to uphold as our oath of office. Um, I think that some people forget that just an intriguing guy. I mean, could have sat down with him forever and just shot the breeze. Gonna be really interesting to see where that career of his takes him, the trajectory of it all. Impressive fella, no doubt. 
No less impressive is the person I have sitting directly across the couch from me. Very kind of you to say thank well, you. Well, I mean, that's what I do, I'm a charmer. Mm, For those of you who aren't familiar, do, they don't, who don't recognize the face, you must be living under a rock. Morgan Fogarty, been in the market, in the media landscape for what, about 15 years here locally? Here in Charlotte, oh, yeah, a little yeah. more than 15 years. Yeah, time flies when you're having fun. So, yeah. you know, we've talked a lot over the last several weeks and gotten some tremendous insight from, you know, a variety of people, demonstrators, protesters, the police, even the police chief, elected officials, and we find a lot of value in maybe speaking with some local media folks, and Morgan's been on the forefront of this story and other important stories over that 15-year career. We found a lot of value in, in picking her brain a little bit, getting a little bit of insight, and on top of the COVID, which really changed your business. Yeah, changed everybody's business. No doubt, yeah. no doubt. Now, now put this on top of that, and we're off to the races. How, how things changed in the business? <laughs> Starting back in March, um, you know, we, we are seeing unprecedented efforts um, to do our work as everybody is while maintaining distance, getting as many people out of our newsroom as we can on a daily basis so that we protect our crew, um, so that we can still continue telling the stories of the community, figuring out how to do socially distanced interviews. You know, you, you talked about those demonstrations and having some of your colleagues on the front lines, those, those <coughs> excuse me, those journalists, uh, I see a lot of them when I'm out there and out and about, and some of them have gone so far, and some stations have gone so far as to have bodyguards, mm -hmm. to have security teams with them, why? Um, so that was something that actually started happening during uh, September of 2016 when Keith Lamont Scott was yeah. uh, killed. And there was a, a several days of unrest in Charlotte then. I think a lot of news teams in the Charlotte area in particular um, learned that we needed to have an extra set of eyes as well um, to help navigate sort of those scenarios. Uh, when your photographer is with you and you are the reporter, you are both focused on telling the story, you're looking at um, different areas where you need to be capturing video, you're interviewing people and you're focused on listening and hearing what they say, you don't have eyes at the back of your head. So having a third person out there whose only job is to be that head on a swivel helps us do our job of delivering stories to the community. You know, and she brings up a really good point. I remember years back when I was reporting and recovering journalists, for those who, who don't know, but I was with WBTV, one of her, I don't know if I, I go so far as to say the competition, but uh, the CBS affiliate in Charlotte, and I remember doing a, a live shot out in Thomasboro neighborhood one night, and it was for the 11 o'clock broadcast, and we had done our live shot, and there were a gaggle of young people that were standing behind me during the live shot, and I remember in my ear, after the live shot was done, my producer or the director getting in my ear and telling me, hey, did you see what just happened behind you? And I'm like, no. And uh, hustle back to the station, I wanna show you uh, the live shot. Uh, during the live shot in Thomasboro, there was a young man in that gaggle that was waving a gun around mm -hmm. behind me. And she's absolutely right. You know, you're just immersed in that work. You got the videographer who's just immersed in that, in that viewfinder, and you're, you're, you know, your colleagues are out there doing their thing and, and reporting. You don't know what's going on around you. You have hundreds and hundreds of people out there in the fray, anything could happen, I guess, and that's why you know it's so prudent, I guess, to have security out there. Yeah, I don't know that it's necessarily um, something that we we view as security. I think it's an extra person whose specialty and expertise is monitoring those situations to keep us aware and and move us if we need to be moved. What's been the word, you know, on the street? You know, how uh, what's been your your observation so far? Important story, right? Uh, I, I mean, regardless of where you fall with you know, police, anti-police, pro-police, anti-demonstrator, pro-demonstrator, uh, uh, demonstrators, uh, you know, there's, there's, been, um, there's been some movement because of, this, of these demonstrations over the, over the last couple of weeks. You know, we've seen policy change, we've seen uh, internal reviews that have been assigned and asked for, uh, you have you know, some important, uh, an important resolution that was just passed not too long ago by, by the city council you know, putting a moratorium on chemical agents, the purchase of them through any kind of budgetary funding through the fiscal year 2021. Mm -hmm. I mean, for those who say that these demonstrations don't mean a lick, I mean, I, I don't think you right. have to look as far as what we've seen over the last week. And the creation of a standing committee um, made up of city manager and city council mm -hmm. to um, scrutinize the um, policy administration and police spending as well. Um, that was part of Braxton Winston's motion that passed um, recently as well. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the point of protest, right, is to move the needle. Um, so I think that's what we're seeing.
Yeah, and few would argue that they have moved that needle. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, be quite honest, I, I took a, a very myopic kind of look at it, having managed demonstrations, and part of demonstrations on the police end of things back in New York in the 90s in Crown Heights and Washington Heights. Uh, you know, I was one of those naysayers, and well, you know, these people are just wasting their time. They're just spinning their wheels. You know, get out there and do something with you know with your lives. All you're doing is tying up traffic and making it, you know, difficult for everybody in the community. So for me to be as close to this as I've been over the last couple of days, and to see these, and I nobody's going to convince me otherwise, these monumental changes that I think they've accomplished because of their movement and their, and their demonstrations has been been eye opening. I could tell you, 30 years in, in the law enforcement business, I've never seen swift change the extent that I've seen over the last week or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it really is impressive regardless of you know, where you land on whether you agree with them or, or not. How about from a media perspective? You saw the George Floyd video. Mm -hmm. you know, your thoughts just uh, you know, 30,000 feet. When it, you, did you know as a journalist, did you know as a person, this is gonna be a big deal? Of course, I, I knew that the, what happened to George Floyd was going to be a news story. Mm -hmm. um, did I think that it would be that it would lead to what is looking like a watershed moment in this country's history? No, um, because unfortunately we've seen video after video of George Floyd type situations um, where there is outrage and there is uh, calls for justice and there is demand for change. And unfortunately, um, those those needles didn't get moved. For whatever reason, what happened with George Floyd seemed to be a tipping point in that uh, in the movement uh, for police reform and racial equality. And um, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I predicted any of this. No, I did not. Um, but of course, the George Floyd uh, video in and of itself, yes, that we knew that would be newsworthy. Observations when you saw it, outrage, you know, I mean, sickened, how would you characterize it? I think anybody who sees that video would agree that it's appalling behavior. Um, I think that, uh, I, I don't, I, I struggle to understand, like very, like everybody else, frankly, and, and many police officers as well, how that scene played out for as long as it did. I want to flip the script, though. I want to ask you a question. What sort of conversations are you having with officers within CMPD about that video? What What is their reaction to you? What do they tell you when the cameras aren't around? I think we just sugarcoated our reaction when you juxtapose that to what I'm hearing out on the street. They are flat out sickened, sickened when they see something like that. You know, look, uh, the code in the game, oh, in addition to a retired or recovering journalist, retired New York cop. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the code in the game of policing. When the handcuffs are on somebody, it's over, right? It's over, especially when somebody's not resisting. You know, I don't know if that cop had racism in his heart when he leaned on that man's neck. I don't know if he was a racist. I do know he was chicken <laughs> You just don't do something like that to somebody when they're prone like that and in handcuffs. That's a chick <laughs> move and there's not a cop alive that I know that would disagree with that. And that's just the, the, the flat out truth. So I think we've kind of glossed over what our real feelings are. I mean, if we had some time to really dig in, I could really get enraged. Uh, I think a lot of cops feel that way. And I think a lot of them are really disappointed that all of the monumental, all of the monumental advances that they've made with police and community relations have just essentially evaporated over one single situation like that, uh, that, that happened you know, more than a thousand miles away. And it, it's, de it's demoralizing. They get it. I talked to a cop in a car last night, a veteran police officer, African-American police officer, broke down in tears. I haven't met one officer that has, you know, if what happened to George Floyd was a good thing and no one's said anything good about the officers or come to defend them. I mean, it was horrible. It was sickening. I mean, I told my wife that night, I said, you know, the worst parts of it that I saw when watching that video is when he started crying for his mama, you know? I, I mean, I just, I, I get teared up now because I think of my kids, you know? So that's, you know, those are the kind of things that, I, that I'm hearing uh, out there in the street. And, uh, you know, it's, it's awfully difficult. It was tough to be a cop before. This just doesn't improve those, uh, the, those, those matters at all now when, when you have something like this. They're hurting. Community's hurting. Everybody's hurting. When you say that you think that there, you described it as monumental bridges that had been built, you used the word monumental. Um, do you think that that is an accurate assessment given now what you're seeing and hearing from the community 
about the long-standing concerns and issues that that many in our community have with police work you know I I, I think everybody it's I, maybe it's in the eye of the beholder you know I, I base it on and I know it's no scientific barometer of what I see and some events that I've attended and work that we do with community engagement and um, I do think that you know coming off of where I came off of in the, in the 90s when I was policing there was a, I think a bigger divide between the African-American community and law enforcement and I know it was a different region I was policing up in New York uh, I, I, I do see that there's more more uh, of, of a collective kind of relationship between the community and, and police you know decades later than what I what I've seen it's not as big of a divide but I, but I'm going to be quite honest with you Morgan I, you know just having walked the streets with demonstrators for several nights you know and interviewing some of them I mean the distrust is real mm -hmm. you know the distrust is real now I don't know if it was you know Mr. Floyd that that prompted this or if this is something that's just been deep seated through, throughout the years that's just manifesting itself now um, I believe and again just and it's just my journey that you know we've come a long way since since the 90s um, did this kind of catapult us back into the 90s now? I, I, I don't know. I think this, we're, we're, we're going to be in an awfully difficult position to make up for a lot of this lost territory. I don't know if we ever see it in our lifetime. I just don't. So one of the things that you and I talked about also that is similar in our lines of work is you can do 95% good, you screw up 5%, and that's it. The trust is eroded. I can tell 95%, 100% accuracy of my stories. Yeah. That 5% that I screw up is what defines me, right, sure. wrong, or indifferent. Sure. And it's the same for police work. Um, when the 4th Street incident happened, mm -hmm. I think that that had a monumental, to use your word, impact oh on what we're seeing in Charlotte right now in this moment as well. Bubbles up as we speak. You know, I talked about all those days out on the streets with those demonstrators. and. You're, you're hard pressed to find anyone who doesn't bring up Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and look, 95% of it may have been great. That doesn't excuse the 5% that could have gone sideways. And as we broadcast or as we tape this, that's right now in the hands of the, uh, the State Bureau of Investigation. And by the time this does air, that may be resolved. They mm -hmm. don't know, don't have any inside information or anything else like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's real, and that's the, you know. You, I mean, look at the optics. I'm not going to sit here and pass judgment over a, over a video that I saw, um, but what I, I mean, I saw what you saw and what the community saw, and it looks like garbage. It just looks like garbage to have people, young people, most of whom young people, hundreds of them, mm -hmm. that for all you know, intent and purposes, at least according to that video, just marching up the street. Mm -hmm. Chemical agents on one side of the street, chemical agents on the other side of the street, and then boxed in the middle like that. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a, a damn good, you know, excuse for why things developed the way that they developed, but the optics are horrible. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find an officer who says that was a good look, because that was not a good look. And to your point, you could have 95, you could have 99% of your operations that were carried out with precision. People are going to remember Tuesday. They're not going to remember the 99%. Do you know why the police department and elected leaders have not been able to say definitively yet who gave the order for the 4th Street incident? Well, I, you know, I think it, I know uh, the, the chief, he himself, had come out and say, it's my order. You know, it's my order. It was my operation. I okayed the operation. The mm -hmm. buck stops with him as the leader of the organization. And it's just, you know, it wouldn't be fair to put it on someone who executed his operation you know, that, that's what leadership looks like. So what do you think about the not being able to purchase chemical agents in 2021? You know, I, I hear two, two different sides. You know, the optics looks, just look horrible. You know, uh, then I hear, uh, you know, if, if you take that tool off the tool belt, then now you're put in a position where, you know, something does erupt in a crowd. How do we manage that? Do we have to go in there? Do we have to go in there? I don't know. Because that's going to, you, you th thought that looked bad Tuesday night? You ain't seen what bad looks like until you see a gaggle of cops have to go into a, an unruly crowd and try to break something like that up. Uh, we heard Braxton Winston say at Monday's meeting that going in with batons and billy clubs is not the answer. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is another answer? I've yet to hear it if there is, and I'm open to anything. I've been doing this for 30 years. I just don't know in good conscience what, I mean, is hey guys, stop. The, Please stop hurting each other. Don't throw it a rock. Hey, you're hurting her. I mean, I'm, 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 no, Morgan, I I'm, not, I'm not being I, flippant. I, I, I know. I just, 
is there a possibility that retreating works? But it, what people fail to recognize is it's just not police that are getting hurt. I get You know, that. it's other people that, that, you know, a brick, that. you know, could be a young woman that's out there exercising her First Amendment right who's getting pelted in the back of the head with a brick. Are we supposed to walk away? I'm not, I'm not, I, I do not proclaim to be a law enforcement mm -hmm. police reform expert. Hey, maybe we should do this uh, routinely because, oh I mean, we've gosh. been talking about You're exhausting. I'm trying to <laughs> end on a positive note, for heaven's sake. <laughs> I would love to come back and do it again. You've been gracious. You. you have. You have been gracious. Listen, And we've I had want... conversations before. She always holds her ground. I respect that. You know what I found rich during our whole alleged dust up? <laughs> that you had some men reporters who were like, don't pick on Yeah. Believe me, this woman can hold her own. She doesn't need anybody defending her. Yeah. So that's just that. Let's just start there. I appreciate there. the support, but yeah. Um, and listen, I want, like, you know, I don't know what you're, what you're going to do with this on your end, but for our Facebook viewers, I want you to understand, like, this is very normal, healthy dialogue. I think so. This is, um, this is how, you know, relationships are built. And Rob and I have a relationship, and this is why we can have an in-depth conversation like this where we talk about uncomfortable things and we push each other because we can go be beneath the surface a little bit, I think. She doesn't take it personally. I know I don't take no, it personally. No, I absolutely don't take it personally. I think this is, this sort of conversation is necessary. Um, and I, I am appreciative that you, you invited me to come in here. I wish you'd worn a mask. <laughs> Something else, you just wanna let it go. Uh, no, I, you know, I look forward to um, continuing to grow our relationship, both you and I, and more importantly, the news media in Charlotte and CMPD. Amen. See, we're in lockstep there, too. For the betterment of our community. Always got a pile on. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and at the end of the day, that's what it's about. I'm a foolish enough to believe that we can communicate directly to our community without the reach. I mean, you guys have tremendous wield tremendous reach and influence and that's important yeah and we are, we are we are always always working to maintain that respect and trust we don't take it for granted and um, resting on our laurels is not what we're interested in doing every syllable she means exactly what she says and I'll just say it because she's sitting across from me and because we're professional friends and known each other for a long time gracious enough took time out of her day I'm sure her docket is just slamming children, work, personal stuff, and uh, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Thank I, you for I, having From the bottom me. of my heart, I mean, I, I really think it was helpful. We talked about how we've been out on some of those lines over the last several days during the demonstrations and actually had an opportunity with our cameras to capture some of the flavor out there during the demonstrations and thought it would be a good idea to maybe to just to give you a little sample size of, of some of the flavor and what people were thinking and what they had on their minds. And I'm not surprised that it happened to a black boy and I'm not surprised that he was unarmed. I'm not surprised that he, even if he was resisting, that does not give the cops the justification to kneel on him. And that goes for any person that was killed by the cops. And once again, that does not matter the race. I don't care who it is. I feel like higher authority is taking advantage. I don't know why or who or what's behind it, but it needs to stop. We've been dealing with this for too long. I've had the privilege of speaking to some of these fellow officers, male and female out here over the last couple days and, and just kind of seeing what, what, what a new training structure looks like, what a new program looks like. How do we, how do we de-escalate better? How do we, how do we process our emotions better? You know, when our law enforcement officers have to respond to calls where, you know, they're fearing for their lives and not sure if they're going to make it home. And, you know, um, I think also too reform for me looks like um, also being the change that we want to see. So if we want better in law enforcement, we also need to put ourselves in position to be in those offices and to be part of law enforcement. Um, just also um, just kind of bridging that gap and I think just being transparent and having communication um, on both ends. We're not taking it anymore. At this point, things have to change. Things are getting violent. Things are getting out of hand. It's just becoming too much. There's no justice here. Um, it's really sad that the people that we trust to protect us day in and day out, you know, before this, I, I felt safe by the police. And then now, you know, it just feels like, should I be scared? Should I be scared of people that are going to be protecting me? Do I know what to expect when, you know, I get pulled over? Um, I just, you know, you, you can't be for certain now, now, and that's really scary. It's scary to live in a world where you're not sure the people that are supposed to keep you safe can actually do that or will or want to. And it's sad.
Well, definitely some spirited opinion out there. Some would argue in flat out anger when it comes to, to the profession. Really eye opening to have the opportunity to get out there and hear some of that flavor from out on the street for the last several days. You know, Tommy, Tommy, one take, by the way, on the back end with us on the broadcast, you were along with me. And I, I remember was. before we even went out there, you were like, you know, is this the best decision? I got my uniform on and, you know, how am I going to land? How am I going to be received? What were your thoughts? I mean, you know, I, I didn't want to go. I, I didn't want to go out there. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until actually the main protest had ended and people were kind of scattering different ways. I was like, okay, we can go out there now. And it, it wasn't what I thought. In, in terms of what, you, you, know, you, you think you were just going to be met with all this opposition, all this resistance, name calling, vitriol? Yeah, yeah I thought it was going to be a, a flash mob. You know, I thought I was just going to go out there and be berated up and down because of the uniform. And it was, you know, I, I listened and it was, it was hard to see that one female just get upset by my appearance. Yeah. How he, emotional that was for her. And, and, and that's hard because, I mean, I painted them all with a broad brush by yeah. not wanting to go out there. And she was kind of doing that in return. So that's something that I really took away from that is, you know, we need to look at each other in different lights. I mean, we were walking back into the station. Guy comes up to me and says, hey, can we get a picture together? And he wanted a picture of us shaking hands. Yeah. And, you know, th that's all he wanted. He said, hey, thanks, man. And yeah. just to show that relationship. So it was, uh, it was different than I expected. Yeah, yeah I, I think you nailed it right on the head. I, too, you know, going into this, you know, with a very myopic lens, you know, that, uh, you know, they, they're just all cop haters, you know, they're just unreasonable, you know, strident, you know, they don't want to, they're not interested in relationships at all. And there's some, very small minority of them, you know, maybe 1% that, that feel that way. But the overwhelming majority of them, these are just people, whether you agree with them or not, they're just people who want to express themselves, that want to bring attention to what they feel are some just, you know, grave injustices that have been perpetrated in the in the profession for years and now is the opportunity with this George Floyd disaster to kind of bring that uh, to to the forefront it was funny you you're right man I, I saw people grabbing you and, and trying to take selfies with you you know I know it wasn't what you expected no and just because I don't agree with them doesn't mean I can't listen mm -hmm. and I mean, we all have different viewpoints and you're right there's there's far ends of the spectrum even when you come to the police side of it and to the protester side of it and so it's important to just be willing to listen and, and try to see a different side of it and just digest that. Yeah, how about, you know, you can have a over step and let me know. Words do hurt, though. And, you know, when you do feel like you're on an island and your whole profession and just the mere side of you is enough to trigger somebody into hatred and venom and vitriol, uh, that, that's demoralizing. You, you'd come home and, and you know, it, not to, only does it impact the people that wear the uniform, but the people who are at home who support the uniform, like spouses. Your wife was really worked up about this. Yeah, it's, it's a hard time to be a cop right now. Yeah. You know, I don't think anyone signed up for this. Yeah. No one, when they said, I want to be a cop, thought that they'd be on the front lines of a skirmish line, you know, facing protesters right in front of them. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's emotional, even for, for spouses, you know, or, or parents, you know, my parents call me, hey, what's going on, are you okay? But my wife said she had to put down Facebook because it just, it, you know, I, I saw it almost bring her to tears just wow. because of what she's reading and, and how people are viewing law enforcement. And she knows, that's not the cops she knows. Yeah. That's not the guys I work with. That's not my friends that I have in law enforcement. Yeah. And so it's hard to see people um, put that out there and, and for her to think that people are reading that and, and thinking that's who we are. There, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who hasn't been moved in some way, shape or form by what's developed out there in, in Minneapolis and to see a, you know, a hardened, good officer, guy who's been on the job for a long time, tough guy like Justin to be moved to the extent that he was. I mean, it's just telling. You know, I know you run in a lot of cop circles, nobody supporting what they saw out there in Minneapolis. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to speak for all of them, but all the ones I've talked to, I haven't met one that says, yeah, that's, that's, that should have happened. I mean, it's, you, you can't defend it. I can't watch that video as a law enforcement officer and say that was okay what happened. That's, you, good. That, that's not how we're trained and that's, that's not who we are. Yeah.
Yeah, and it's a, it's a shame that you, know, you have a pro whole profession now that are really paying the, paying for the sins of something that happened more than a thousand miles away, especially you not know, the least of which is is our organization here. Yeah. You know, I'm walking up and down that line over the last couple of nights of officers, and it, it's heartbreaking. It's it's just heartbreaking to see just how demoralized they are. Doesn't do anything to advance relationships, especially in the African American community. What happened out there? No, it's like we take you know two or three steps backwards, but we're I mean forward, but we're taking ten steps backwards. Yeah, and it, it's frustrating. I think as officers. Um, not to minimize what's going on, but we're tired of having to fight this fight right now because um, as all, yes, there are a few bad apples out there and they create a bad name for us. But majority, I would say, officers are good people that wanted to be cops to fight crime. And so here we are continually resetting this clock and fighting this narrative that we're racist or police brutality. And, and that's not what we're about. Anything good? I mean, it's so tragic, and it, it you know, it's, you'd really have to squint hard right now with the state of affairs in the country, and I, I guess around the world right now with the way that things are developing. Anything positive, you know, on the forefront that you could envision? I know you have to squint hard, but you know, can something positive come out of something so tragic? Well, we're not talking about COVID. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and we're still right there, we're right there with that too, for um, sure. You know, is this an opportunity though? Is this, you know, everybody's talking about these watershed moments, these really reset moments. Is this is an opportunity possibly? It could be, but I think it's up to us to decide whether it is or not, you know? Um, well, you know, it, we talked about it's important that we're out there listening, but that goes to both sides of the table too. You know, you saw last week, the chief went out to the government center and you know the protesters are clamoring for him to come out there to speak and when he got out there he was speaking but no one's listening because all people are doing is just screaming over him yeah so if we're going to take advantage of this and, and try to learn from this it needs to be both sides of the table being willing to listen to what everyone has to say because there's not one side that is completely right or wrong and w we got to meet in the middle well maybe that's this is where it starts you know, it's kind of reassuring, encouraging to see that things have leveled out somewhat, uh, a lot more conversation over confrontation, and, and maybe that's where it's, it's got to begin. There's already been some policy changes, some internal reviews for accountability. You know, at, at the end of the day, it, it's not the whole journey, but it's maybe the beginning steps of a, a, of a long journey, and I guess it's got to start somewhere. So. Yeah. To be continued, I, I don't suspect this is going to be anything that's yeah. going away anytime soon, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we need to spend a lot more time here, really dig into some of the bigger issues, pick it all apart, and we'll do just that in a relatable, raw, relevant kind of, uh, of manner, and uh, that's the way it, you know, it's going to shake out. So stay tuned. Uh, it um, you know, could get bumpy. It could get a little uncomfortable. That's what growing pain sometimes feel like, but that's, uh, that's what it's all about. You know, if you want to grow and, and develop, sometimes that's going to require some growing pains. So we, we've had a hell of a show. I mean, Morgan and Captain Koch and the demonstrators and then Tommy One Take on the back end. We appreciate everyone's time. You know, you got a lot of things to do, a lot of places to do it, and for you to spend a couple of minutes with us, it's, we're just eternally grateful. Look out for each other, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay tuned.